A box filled with discarded household objects, food trays, lace curtains, a teddy. Also within it, what looks like a child's notebook, clumsily shoved in and torn up. It sits next to a busy main road, consisting of residential housing stretching out from behind the notebook, and then, on the opposing side, various retailers, chicken shops, and a pub. Its existence as a rejected object seems a grim reminder of the realities of aging and the passing of time. On one side of the sketchbook, a coagulation of aggressive and expressive scribbles in what looks like purple biro, and on the other, a collection of sequential numbers ripped to reveal a page beneath with the words cat, dog, and 910. It somewhat reflects how the street it was situated in felt, with one side being a chaotic and unpredictable mist that constitutes family life, and the other capitulating the order and predictive routine of the working life. The notebook would have almost definitely originated from the residential side before it was subjected to deterioration by the roadside. However, it is important to note that before this, the notebook would have originated from the retail side of the road, packaged in plastic, untouched and pure. But with this purity comes repetition and an absence of uniqueness, far from how it is now. Its prominence, in comparison to the other objects I'd encountered, was that it was alone in its lack of reproductibility. It is of wonderment, therefore, why an object of such rarity and uniqueness would be rejected in such a violent and cruel fashion. The writing on the torn pages contained a certain recklessness to them, as though the child was not yet of an age where they had succumbed to the pressures of striving for perfection when they faced the production of such an object. So perhaps it is that the child began to transmit their experimental and expressive energy onto the originally perfect sheets of lined paper, until all that remained in the child's mind was the ordered and routine values that the sketchbook had once originally held. And as the child started to feel the social pressures of perfection, they rejected the evidence of freedom and uniqueness they had previously created. Perhaps it was not the child choosing to reject this object, but instead the parent. As if the already supporting disciples of this society that the child had been created by rejected the works of disobedience in an act of parental love, believing that rejection of these free expressions would allow for a better adaptation and acceptance into the society, and believed that the evidence of experimentation and freedom would only take up necessary room in their house and in the child's developing life. Or perhaps this was not a consensual act of acceptance into the confines of society, but instead an act of surrender to their peers, whereby the child fell victim to a more forceful introduction into the social expectations of the society they resided within. Reading of this notebook in this condition, along with the other childlike belongings, certainly suggests that either reasoning for it being rejected would result in the child crossing the road and surrendering to routine and predictive behaviour. The real mystery would be whether this was by choice or by force, but is this ever really by choice when there is no escape? No matter what, the other side of the road will always exist, and the child will have to confront the crossing at some point.